Hi. Hi, how are you? Good. So we're working for our guest artist, Salvador Jimenez uh, Flores, who's working with our Museum of Glass team. And they're, he's designing these sculptures, and our team is making the sculptures. Yeah, come on, sit down. So the one we're working on now is the one that's drawn on the floor. You can see his, his notebook, same design. And when we approach these, we usually make all the little parts first. We place them into this oven over here called the garage. Keep them warm. We'll make the body, main body of the sculpture, and we'll stick all the little parts on. So right now, they're making this sort of cactus paddle. We're making the, also, Sarah's making the, the cactus fruits. So everything is going to, we're going to make all the little stuff, go put it in the garage, then we'll blow the, all this part, and then we'll put all the little, stick on the little parts. You see that drawing on the floor? That's what we're making.
So the folks that are working the glass today are our Museum of Glass glass blowers. Leading the team today is Gabe Feenan, the man with the hat. On the right, Sayuri Fukuda. Just got some glass out of the furnace. And over by the garage, Carly Uphoff. So we're making the designs of our guest artist, Salvador Jimenez Flores. All the glass that's in our furnaces is clear glass. We buy our colored glass in various forms. We buy it in bars. These are called color bar. We buy it in little chips of colored glass called frit. We make the thing out of clear glass and then we coat it with the colored glass. So right now Carly in the center is heating up a bar of the colored glass. Over on the right, Sayuri is blowing a bubble of clear glass, and we're gonna coat her clear glass bubble with the colored glass. Every once in a while, these steel pipes get hot. When they do, we take them over to that trough. That's called the pipe cooler. We spray water on the metal pipe. That cools it down and makes it easier to hold. We have two basic kinds of furnaces. We have the glass furnaces and the glory holes. The glass furnaces are the ones where you see the doors closed. If you look up on the big screen, you'll see a diagram. That's what they look like inside. Each one of them has a big ceramic pot. In that ceramic pot is a thousand pounds of melted glass. We keep the melted glass at 2140 degrees. At that temperature, the glass has the consistency of honey. It's like a big giant crock pot full of honey. We want to get it out to make stuff. We take one of those steel pipes, those are called blow pipes, and we dip them into the big tank of molten glass. A little bit of the glass sticks to the end of the pipe. The pipe itself is hollow, so when you blow, the ball of glass blows up like a balloon. All glass, when it's really hot, looks orange. The orange color that you're seeing is the glow from the heat, not the color of the glass. We're about to coat Sayuri's bubble with green glass. Carly's coming over with the green glass. We drop a big blob on top of her clear bubble. and then it will smear that colored glass till it entirely coats the original bubble. Layered, yeah, we, we, so we're gonna coat that bubble, then we let it cool a bit and stiffen, then we'll dip it in the clear glass again. And we just keep repeating that process until we have all the glass we need to make whatever we're making.
Do you guys have any questions? That depends on you. It's like it's like music or sports. Different people take to it different amounts of time. Gabe is leading our team today. He's been blowing glass for 27 years. And he's a... Sarah's been working for about 24 years. Sayuri about 17 years. Car Carly about six or seven. Put the drawing up on the big screen. So this is the sculpture that we're making. It's designed by our guest artist, the man in the flowered shirt, Salvador Jimenez Flores. So he's our guest artist, and everything we're making is his design, and he's working with our resident team of glass blowers, and they're making the glass according to his design. He's not a glass worker by trade, so we're helping him out and making his sculptures. So all the sculptures you see on the pedestals, on the table, these are all things we made this week. He's been our guest artist from Wednesday through today. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. He does like cactus a lot. He grew up in Mexico where there's a lot of cactus and he thinks cactuses are a symbol of resilience, of uh, dealing with tough circumstances and thriving. The glass in the furnace is 2,140 degrees. That's as hot as the hottest volcano. How do we what? You be careful. We get we get a glass. It kind of, we get all the ingredients kind of mixed together. Uh, it's like a cake mix. It's got all the ingredients in it. And we shovel it into the furnace and we cook it overnight. And all the ingredients melt together and make glass. Well, there's three main components to glass. Sand, it's mostly melted sand. Soda ash, which is a chemical which lowers the melting temperature of the sand. And lime, which stabilizes the mixture chemically. So sand, soda ash, and lime. Put them in a big furnace, cook them overnight at 2400 degrees. They all melt together and make glass. Yes. Get the, the ingredients for the glass. Where do we get the sand from? Well, we get it from a company in North Carolina. I don't know where they get their sand. Well, no, she's not putting any water on the glass. The tool that she's shaping the glass with is made out of wood, so we have to keep the tool wet so it doesn't burn when it touches the glass. Mm -hmm. 
It depends on you. It's like learning music or sports. Different people take to it at different rates. You guys know about our contest for kids? Any kid that comes to the museum can do a drawing, 12 and under, and once a month we pick one of the drawings and we make it out of glass. We'll make whatever you drew out of glass. We'll make two copies, one for you to keep and one for the museum. We have a little video. Can we show kids design glass? You can see what we've done with some of the kids in the past. Pip is a baby monster that loves to smile and laugh. Even though he's little and cute, he gives a big cry. Also, Pip loves food, especially bananas. He will eat any speck of food in sight. just somebody else that, you know, they did it, you know, it, I couldn't do that. Absolutely not. Anyone can do this. It's, and I think that's what it shows the kids. Maybe not everybody can handle it. But, <laughs> and that, and that. I think it's going to be, it's going to stand up there with one of the coolest things that, that a museum has ever done. What is it, a, a, cucum a cucumber all dressed up for a night on the town? I, that's, that's pretty ridiculously funny. The funnest part about this project is how fresh the ideas are coming from the kids who they, they have no idea of glass blowing techniques, they don't care. Nobody saw this coming. We'd make one piece and it was given to the family. And then we realized, well, wait a second, there's something more here. We started to get more drawings, more interesting drawings, and it really kind of snowballed a little bit. Bacon Boy was special.
thank you for supporting Kids Design Glass. <laughs> so if you want to enter the contest, there's a table out in the lobby with drawing materials and entry forms. If you don't feel like drawing right now, grab an entry form, one for each kid, and you can do the drawing at home and mail it in. Yeah. Usually they take about two and a half hours. going to be the same sort of scale that you see here. Yeah, kind of like the one, a little bit bigger than the one that's lying in the foam. Sculpture? We're not done with it. We've got a long ways to go. But it's going to be similar size to like the one you see in the foam, on the foam. drawing and then at the end of the month we pick one of the drawings and whoever ones we pick that's the one we make we'll make two of them one for you to keep and one for the museum just one person yep it's a contest okay no no if you it's got to be something that you made up yourself can't be something that you like saw on TV. Hi. How are you guys? Good. So we're working with our guest artist. Uh, where is he? He's around here somewhere. Can we put the drawing up on the big screen? So that's his drawing, and we're making this sculpture. So our guest artist is not a glassmaker. He works in clay and bronze and printmaking, but he doesn't do glass. So when we have an artist from outside of glass, we have our resident team of glass blowers, and they make the object from his design. So in the same style, but Well, it's just a convenient place to put it. This is called an annealer. It's for cooling the glass down slowly when we're done. Everything has to be cooled. Don't let that fancy handle fool you. It's an electric oven, like an electric kiln you'd have for pottery. And when we, we finish something, we put it in here, and we cool it down very slowly overnight. We put it in very carefully, yes. No, uh -uh. no. There's, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four. Yeah, we really don't do much teaching here. It's pretty much all professionals. Very rarely. The studio is set up to accommodate really big, elaborate projects, 
but it's only rarely that we have all of them going. We only turn on the ones we need for whatever project we're doing. There's two, the two kind of ovens, the glass furnaces run at about 2,140 degrees. The glory holes run at about 2,300 degrees. We made hot dogs in there. Makes really good steaks because it sears them and it keeps the juices in. Sarah in the center is heating up the glass in the glory hole, making it soft. And she's going to bring it to Gabe sitting at the bench, and he's going to start to shape it. He's squeezing it with a tool called the jacks, those big metal tongs, and making a narrow part at the very top. His assistant is holding a wooden paddle in front of his arm to shield him from the heat. So this bubble here is going to be the main body of the sculpture. So Sayuri so sitting to the left of the workbench. She's the person that's blowing. She's blowing through that steel tube, the blowpipe, and inflating the glass as Gabe, sitting at the bench, shapes it. The pad in Gabe's hand that he's shaping the glass with is just folded up ordinary newspaper soaked in water. As long as the newspaper is wet, the paper doesn't burn too much, and it doesn't leave any marks as he shapes the glass. Each time we heat up the glass, it only stays soft for a little while. So we do whatever shaping and blowing we can while it's hot and soft. And then we return to the glory hole, the round furnace, and heat it up and soften it again. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, I'm thinking two, two and a quarter hours, maybe. Anybody wants to take pictures and knock yourselves out? Gabe points the glass down at an angle like that. The bubble is soft, and it'll stretch under its own weight, and it'll make the bubble longer. So right now, that's hollow. Sarah is blowing, inflating it as Gabe shapes it.
Well, uh, we've never done this before. We made, we made some similar objects earlier this week. But there's the drawing on the floor. Let's see that chalk drawing by the steel table. That's what we're making. What? What's on the floor? You see the chalk drawing? Can we put the chalk drawing up on the big screen? Look up on the big screen. Uh, Gabe, the man's league, our team, 27 years. Thank you, Chris. That's water. As long as you keep the newspaper wet, the paper doesn't burn too much, it doesn't leave any marks on the glass. Can we put up the newspaper photo? So it's just ordinary newspaper folded up a bunch of times and soaked in water. The torch allows us to focus the heat in a particular place. When we heat it up in the big round oven, it kind of heats it up generally. We need to focus the heat in a per particular place we use the torches. Yes. So now Gabe has grabbed two paddles made out of cork, like cork in a wine bottle, as you give that bubble a squeeze. You guys have any questions? Yeah, they're made out of cork. Cork, like cork in a wine bottle. It allows us to press on a surface fairly hard without leaving any marks. They'll, they, they'll put on gloves if they, well, he's wearing a glove, actually. Gabe's got a glove on his left hand. They only put gloves on when they, they become uncomfortable.
So we've been working on this sculpture for about an hour. We've made a bunch of the little parts. We've placed them in this oven over here called the garage where they're being kept warm. And once we get the main body of the sculpture made, we'll start to stick on the smaller parts. Carly has a compressed air gun and she's blowing the smoke away from the corks so it doesn't go in Gabe's eyes. torch in his hand is a propane oxygen torch. It has a 5,000 degree flame. It allows us to get one small area of the glass very hot very quickly. Uh, there's four uh, setups like this. There's one at the Corning Museum of Glass in New York. Uh, there's one at the Toledo Art Museum in Ohio. And there's one at the Chrysler Museum in Norfolk, Virginia. And there are museums that have kind of this uh, demonstration glass shops like you see here. Yes. Uh, no. We do have some uh, people who graduated Hilltop part-time, but there's none of them here today. Furnaces and the glory holes are powered by natural gas. The torches are propane.
So now Gabe is heating up the two sides of that glass object. And we're going to push them together and make a kind of flattened part in the middle of that form. We'll suck in a little. And the two sides will collapse and fuse together. The torches allow us to focus the heat in a particular place. We can soften just the part of the glass that we want to shape. So this sculpture that we're making is the design of our guest artist, the man in the flowered shirt, Salvador Jimenez Flores. He's our guest artist this week, and he's working, he's not a glassmaker himself, so he's working with our resident team of glass blowers to make his sculptures. You can see some examples on the two pedestals and on the table. So now she's sucking in, and that'll draw the two sides together. So instead of blowing, she's sucking in, so the two sides come together. Does anybody have any questions?
So we're sucking the air out, and the two sides of the glass bubble will come together and fuse. Carly, over on the far right, has gotten some clear glass out of the furnace. And she's rolling it in little chips of colored glass called Frit, F-R-I-T. Can we put up the Frit photo? So when we want to color things quickly, we take clear glass out of the furnace. We roll it in these little chips of colored glass, and then we put it in the fire, the little chips melt, and it forms a candy coating of colored glass like an M&M. We're going to add some of the flames to the side of the sculpture. So Sayuri on the right in the black shirt and shorts is preparing the glass for the flame. She'll bring it to Gabe in the center. He'll stick it on. He's going to draw it out so we get a nice skinny little tip. Yes. We, we use a specially formulated glass for hand blowing. No. Uh, the glass that goes into bottles is formulated to harden very quickly, so a machine can make a thousand bottles in an hour. And so it's, it's not really suited to what we're doing here.
all the colors you see while we're working are distorted by the heat. So the glass that we're making the flames out of is red glass, but it's going to look almost brown or black while we work with it. They have all different stories. Uh, Gabe, who's leading our team today, he learned at work. He's a, he got a job in a glass shop in his early 20s, not knowing anything, and just worked ever since. Sayuri learned in Japan at an art college. Carly uh, learned in a college in the Midwest. She's a recent graduate. There's no formal system for uh, becoming a glassblower here in the United States, so people come to it with very different experience. Uh, yeah, these guys will work together. Sarah and Gabe have been working together for about 16, 17 years. Uh, Carly uh, Sayuri has been working with us on a very part-time basis for about nine years. And Carly has been with us on a part-time basis for, I don't know, a year, maybe. These guys are all very talented glass blowers, and they could go to another shop and fit right in. Say it again? When they choose to collaborate, what was the last part? Oh, yeah, they're working for the museum today. Yes.
you're making the designs by that guy in the floral shirt. Oh, okay. And uh, can we put the drawing up on the big screen? So that's what we're making. So that's his drawing. He drew it on the floor next to the steel table. And so he's, he's Salvador Jimenez Flores. And he's our guest artist this week. And he's working with our Museum of Glass Hot Shop team to execute his sculptures. You can see examples of things we've done all this week. So these are all by Mr. Jimenez Flores. So he's not a glassmaker. This is his first time working with glass. So when an uh, artist brings us a design who's not a glassmaker, we make the object from his designs. So all the colors that you see while we're working are distorted by the heat. So the main body of that sculpture is green. The flames are red. What you see, they don't look that way because of the heat. But when it cools off, they'll return to those colors. Just uh, collapse the center, and that'll be that ring in the center. Hi, how are you guys? Do you guys have any questions? Hey, hi. If you're here with kids, we have a special contest for kids called Kids Design Glass. Any kid that comes to museum 12 and under can do a drawing once a month. We pick one of the drawings and make whatever the kid drew out of glass. We make two copies, one for the kid to take home and one for the museum collection. It's free to enter. There's a table out in the, in the lobby where with uh, drawing materials and entry forms. And so if you want to enter, it's free. And if you win, we'll call you up. You bring the whole family down. And we'll make whatever the kid drew out of glass. Can we put up some of the kids' design uh, stills up on the big screen? So if you look up on the big screen, you can see some of the things we've made from the kids' drawings.
made some of the parts for the sculpture earlier this morning. We placed them in this oven over here called the garage. We call it the garage because that's where we park stuff until we're ready to use it. It operates at half the temperature of the furnaces. It's hot enough to keep the glass from breaking, but it's not hot enough to make it soft. So whatever goes in there stays warm, holds its shape. When we're ready to use it, we'll pull it out and heat it up a little extra. Once we get all the flames squared away, then we'll start to assemble it. We have these skinny little points on the flames. They cool faster than the rest of the glass. So we have to make sure that they stay warm and they don't crack. So as Gabe is forming the next flame, Carly is warming up the tips of each of the older flames. We're on the far right, Sayuri has fished out the cactus paddle that goes on the top of the sculpture. We made that earlier this morning. It's been sitting warming in the garage. And now we're getting ready to attach it.
drilling a small hole in the base. Eventually, we're going to stick another pipe over that hole, and it'll hold the sculpture from the bottom while we shape the top. But because we have a hole there, we'll be able to blow through this, this second pipe into the form to keep it inflated. Attaching the cactus paddle, which we made earlier this morning. Hot glass sticks to hot glass. Next thing we're going to do is attach the little cactus fruits, the tuna they're called. That's the fruit of the prickly pear cactus. So it would be these parts here. Yes. Uh, in Spanish, atun, A-T-U-N, is the tuna, like a tuna fish sandwich. And tuna, like we spell it, is the fruit of the prickly pear cactus. Attach two pieces of glass. We have to heat up the glass itself, the part we're going to attach. We have to also heat up the part we're going to attach it to. When we press two pieces of hot glass together, they stick to each other. While we're working on the top, we have to make sure that the glass wrapped around the end of the steel pipe stays warm or it'll crack. So periodically you'll see one of the glass blowers warm up the glass that's wrapped around the pipe with the torch. Today at 1 o'clock, our guest artist, Salvador Jimenez Flores, is going to be giving a talk here in the hot shop. So you'll be able to ask him questions. He'll tell you about all his various artworks. Can we put up some of Mr. Flores' uh, artworks on the big screen? So if you look up on the big screen, you can see some of his sculptures. He works in many different mediums. He works in bronze, in clay, in printmaking. 
this residency here is his first uh, body of work made in glass. If you want to see what the finished pieces look like, this is his uh, Instagram name. So look at his Instagram, I don't know, a couple of weeks a month, and you'll see all the stuff that he made here at the museum. When we have a complicated sculpture like this, it's always a challenge to keep everything warm at the same time. The little skinny parts cool off quicker than the thick parts. So we have to compensate with that, but for that with the torches. So you see them heat up the tips of the flames. So you want to heat them up enough so they don't crack. We don't want to heat them up too much so they don't lose their shape. So over on the far right, Sayuri has the next tuna, the next cactus fruit. She brings it to Gabe. Gabe heats up the tip where we're going to attach it. We just press the two hot pieces of glass together and they stick to each other. Our team of glass blowers is really talented and experienced. What they're doing today is very difficult. They, they're so good at it, it, it doesn't look, it looks kind of easy, but it beli believe me, it is not.
Okay, uh, when we finish this, we'll put it in an oven called the annealer. Probably put in that big black one over there. And it'll get cooled very slowly overnight. If we just put it on the table and let it cool on its own, it would cool too quickly and unevenly, and it would break. We have one more cactus fruit, I believe. Oh no, now we're gonna put flower, the cactus flowers on. Gabe has the flower. Gabe is a man in a gray shirt and black hat. So all these little parts we made earlier this morning, we've kept them warm in that silver oven in the garage, and now we're assembling. Over on the far right, you'll see Sayuri putting on some protective clothing. She's going to carry the finished sculpture to our annealing oven. We keep the oven hot at 920 degrees all day long. We place all the objects we make during the day in there. And then we'll probably cool this over a day or two. The jacket and gloves that Sayuri is wearing are made out of Kevlar. Kevlar is a fire resistant insulating material. When she grabs that sculpture, it'll be approximately 1,000 degrees. At that temperature, the glass will be hard, and she'll carry it to the annealer, where we'll cool it over a period of a couple of days. So in order to get the glass off the metal rod, we're going to use water. We'll drop some water on the joint between the metal rod and the sculpture itself. The water will crack that joint, and just a light tap on the steel pole will release it. Before we put it in the annealing oven, we want to try and get the temperature as uniform as possible across the whole sculpture.
So here he's warming up the gloves. At this point, if we touch it with something that's room temperature, we could crack the glass. Gabe will take his tweezers, dip them in water. He'll drip some water where we want the glass to break. Oh, he's got a file, a wet file. He's scoring the glass. Gives it a tap. Off it comes. We'll melt the little edges where we broke it off so it's not sharp. And take it to the annealing oven where it'll be cooled very slowly over a couple of days. So let's have a big hand for the Museum of Glass Hot Shop team and our guest artist, Salvador Jimenez Flores. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. You're going to have to speak a little louder. The metal is not as hot as common sense would lead you to believe. blow the body, it makes the flame spontaneously, and then we'll stick on the... So we're going to make some cactus paddles that are going to go on some of the sculptures later. So, so if those guys just came in, we have a guest artist, Salvador Jimenez Flores, the man in the flowered shirt. And he's working with our Museum of Glass Hot Shop team 
to make his sculptures. We often invite artists from outside of the glass world to come and work with us. And when they, they have no glass skills, so they come up with a design and our team of glass blowers makes the actual object. We just finished making the sculpture drawn on the floor. And we're going to make some parts for the next sculpture. A lot of these sculptures have these cactus paddles from the prickly pear cactus. And so we're going to make a couple of those. We don't have time to make an entire sculpture before lunch. So we're going to make some parts for the next sculpture. We'll put them in the garage, keep them warm, and then after lunch, we'll make the next sculpture. It's in that oven over there. In that black oven? It's got to be cooled slowly over several days. you guys have any questions for the artist? Here he is. <laughs> no? <laughs> yes. Oh. So at 1 o'clock this afternoon, which is Less than an hour away, Mr. Uh, Flor Jimenez Flores is going to give a talk here in the hot shop and tell you all about his varied career. And it should be quite interesting. So for those who just came in, give you just a very quick introduction to how glass blowing works. Everything that we do starts out in our glass furnaces. The glass furnaces are the machines where you see the doors closed. If you look up on the big screen, you'll see a diagram. That's what the furnaces look like inside. So each one of them has a big ceramic tank. In that ceramic tank is a 1,000 pounds of melted glass. We keep the melted glass at 2140 degrees Fahrenheit. And at that temperature, the glass has the consistency of honey. So if you can imagine a giant crock pot full of honey, that's what our furnace is like. We want to get the glass out to make stuff. We take one of these steel pipes and we dip them into the melted glass like you're dipping into a big jar of honey. We dip it in, twirl it around. A little bit of glass sticks to the end of the pipe. The pipe itself is hollow, so when you blow, the ball of glass blows up like a balloon. If you want to make something larger, we dip it in, blow a little bubble, let it harden. Then we dip it in a second time or a third time. We just keep building up the glass in layers. All Once we get the glass out of the furnace, it only stays soft for a little while. So we do whatever blowing or shaping we can while it's still hot and soft. When it starts to cool and stiffen, we go to the second type of furnace. The second type of furnace is called the glory hole. The glory holes are the round guys with the doors open. 
Those have no glass in them. They're just a hot chamber for heating and softening the glass while we're working. So Mr. Jimenez Flores is our guest artist. He's here from Wednesday through Sunday. And so everything we're making is his design and it's being executed by our museum team of glass blowers. Anybody have any questions? No. In the museum, we show stuff from all over the world. We're making the sculptures for Mr. Uh, yes. No. No, that's the exhibitions come from all over the world, all different places, historical exhibitions. We do, we make glass here so you can see how it's made. So we make uh, stuff for our guest artists, we make stuff for the store, we do all sorts of things, but not everything that's out there was made here. There's no formal system, no. It's more like learning piano than it is like being a lawyer. So some people learn at work, some people learn in art colleges. Here in Tacoma, you can start learning glass blowing in middle school, in the public schools. So people come to it in all different ways. There's no formal process. No, they were all pretty much the same, a little different s sizes. Okay. But they were all the same machine. They all worked the same way. They all have a, operate the same temperature. They're basically just multiple workstations. No. I think... Uh, Maybe that one was a little bit later, but the others have been here since we opened. So over on the right, we're about to do what's called a color overlay. Sayuri. Standing next to the bench has blown a bubble of clear glass. Carly, standing at the glory hole, is heating up a bar of colored glass. And we're going to coat Sayuri's bubble with the colored glass. So we drop a big blob onto Sayuri's bubble. And she's going to heat that up and smear it until it entirely coats the original bubble. Can we put up the color overlay drawing? So if you look on the big screen, we have a little diagram. So we just did the number one in that diagram. We just dropped on the big blob of color. Now we're going to do number two, where we smear the color until it coats the bubble entirely. And then we're going to dip it in more clear glass. When we blow it up, that colored layer will line the object with color.
So we have a short amount of time until our lecture at 1 o'clock. So we're making some parts for sculptures in the future. And we're making these tongues, these cactus paddle tongues like you see here. So these might go in ceramic sculptures as well as glass ones. Anybody have any questions? So we're flattening the tongue on that ceramic plate. wants a little divot in the center. So we're taking the hot torch and heating up the center. Then he's going to take a metal paddle and he's use the edge of that metal paddle to make the indentation down the center of the tongue. All the colors you see while we're working are distorted by the heat. That tongue is going to be red when it cools off with little kind of gold luster. We call it kind of a kind of shiny amber dots that will represent the spines of a cactus.
Right now, Gabe is doing what's called cane drawing. He's got a stick of glass in one hand, a torch in the other. We're making these kind of cactus uh, paddles. And we're putting on the little spines by melting on little dots of the colored glass. So we're making these tongues that you see in this sculpture. He's putting on all the little dots. Yes. No. Can we put up the uh, cane drawing? drawing? So we have glass in one hand, torch in the other, and we melt on all the little details. So if you just came in, we are working on sculptures. We're making parts right now for our guest artist, Salvador Jimenez Flores. He's the man in the flowered shirt at the center of the workshop. He's our guest artist from Wednesday through today. And he's working with our resident team of glass blowers who are making his designs. He is not a glass blower himself. So when we have an artist who comes from outside of the glass world, they come up with designs and our resident team makes the actual object. Does anybody have any questions? Can we put up how hot is it? So if you're wondering about the temperatures in our different ovens, we have it all lined up on that slide. The orange numbers are centigrade or Celsius. The white numbers are f uh, Fahrenheit. As we make each of these par parts, these we're going to put them in an oven called the annealer, where they'll be cooled slowly overnight. If we just made these and put them on the table and let them cool on his own, their own, they would cool too quickly and unevenly and they would break. He's the man in the flowered shirt. our guest, he, he, has, he makes designs, and we make the objects from his designs. So what is, what is he have a retail business or gallery? No, he's an artist. An art, he's an independent artist. What? Who should pay your intervention fee to make it? No one. Huh? No one. They don't pay? No. He's our guest. have guest artists come, we don't pay them, they don't pay us, and uh, so that you can see different uh, styles of glass making and different artistic approaches. What is this thing inside there? Is that the oven? No, that's the oven. I don't know what you're talking about. Inside the oven, there's a big brown Well. Oh, no, could we put up the glory hole diagram? Okay, I'll get it now. I okay. thought it was a big hole that they kept putting in. Oh, I see. So that's, it's a big brick barrel, the gas burner on the side, and that's so hot that the bricks on the sides are glowing orange. No, no, 
that's just to do it. So over on the right, we're making the next tongue. Sayuri has started the bubble. So it's about 20 to 1. At 1 o'clock, our guest artist is going to give a talk here in the hot shop. You get to ask him questions, hear all about his varied career. So on the two pedestals and on the table, you can see some of the sculptures that we've made for our guest artist during his week of residency. Over to the right of center. Sayuri has dipped her bubble into the big tank of molten glass. The glass that she added is clear glass. The orange color that you're seeing is the glow from the heat, not the color of the glass. These tongues are green. Of course, it doesn't look green right now. That's because of the heat. So now in the center, Gabe has all the glass he needs to make these tongues. Now we're going to blow it up a little, squish it flat, add the little dots, the little spines, and form it into a tongue. The tool in Gabe's hand that he's shaping the glass with is called the block. It's made out of wood. It's stored in a bucket of water. As long as the tool is wet, the tool doesn't burn. It doesn't leave any marks as he shapes the glass. Now he's switching to a pad of wet newspaper, ordinary newspaper soaked in water as long as the paper is wet it doesn't burn too much and it doesn't leave any marks as he shapes the glass we put up the newspaper photo so if you look up on the big screen it's just regular everyday newspaper folded up a bunch of times and soaked in water it gets gray and black from the burning. As long as we keep it wet, it's a very useful tool for shaping the glass.
They said the same about there would be no more radio after television came in. And because television would kill the movies. This is, don't ever believe anybody named they. So Gabe sucked the bubble in, so it's flat. Now Sarah's heating up the center of the tongue. And she's going to take that steel paddle, the tag, and she's making indentation down the center. We'll be starting our talk in about 15 minutes. So you'll, it's, you'll hear all the juicy details from our guest artist, Salvador Jimenez Flores.
Hello, everyone. Uh, we are going to get started with uh, the visiting artist talk in just a few minutes. Um, so if you just remain in your seats, uh, we'll get to that soon. All right. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, greetings everyone. Uh, my name is Jabaria Owens Bailey uh, and I am a curatorial education program manager here at Museum of Glass. Uh, and I just wanted to welcome you all uh, for our artist talk. Uh, we have uh, visiting artists uh, that come throughout the year and uh, each of them gives a talk on Sunday uh, almost at the conclusion of their residency. Uh, and so today we have uh, Salvador Jimenez Flores, uh, who is an interdisciplinary artist. He was born and raised in Jalisco, uh, Mexico. And he explores uh, the politics of identity uh, and the state of double consciousness through his work. Uh, it deals with issues of colonization, migration, being, being the other. Um, and he has presented his work uh, at the National Museum of Mexican Art, uh, Grand Rapids Art Museum, Urban Institute of Contemporary Art, uh, Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts, Museum of Art and Design, amongst others. Uh, he served as an artist in residence for the city of Boston, uh, Harvick Ceram Ceramics, uh, Ceramics Program, and uh, he is a recipient of the Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors Grant, um, as well as many other accolades. Um, and he's a 2021 uh, United States Artist Fellow. He's an assistant professor in ceramics at the School of Art Institute of Chicago. Um, so uh, I would like to introduce you to Salvador Jimenez Flores. And uh, after his talk, uh, he's going to do a, Q a brief Q&A. Uh, so if you have some questions that you develop over the course of the talk, hold them inside till the end and uh, he will uh, call on you to ask the questions. All right, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. Can we just start with a big round of applause for the glass artists who have been making all this work? All this work wouldn't have been possible without all their knowledge, skill, and, and, uh, and labor. So I really appreciate uh, um, all of you guys, uh, all the artists who have been collaborating on these pieces. And um, I'm going to share a little bit of my work. And uh, usually the way I think about my art practice is this idea of the artist, the citizen, and the educator. To me, these three um, parts of my art practice are important because I find like this, this is a way for me to uh, stay like active and have the energy and uh, stay curious, be playful, and also like take risk with these practices. And the way I see is like they help each other out. Like it's not like one is better than the other one, but I, for me personally, I need the three of them. 
So just a little bit of ba uh, background information. I was born and raised in Jamay, Jalisco, Mexico. Migrated here in, two in year 2000. And recently I've, I've been talking to family members and um, I realized that I'm a third generation immigrant to the Midwest in Chicago and Illinois area. And one of the first family members who ventured out over here was my, my great grandfather who was part of the uh, rail workers or the traqueros. So I did a little um, lithograph of, of him trying to just to honor kind of like the labor that he did then. Uh, I'm still trying to gather more information about that, uh, uh, that uh, program, but also like just hearing more from my family as far as like how that went. The other part of the story is my, my dad was part of the Bracero program, which it was a, uh, that allowed Mexican nationals to take tempor temporary agricultural work in the United States. And then uh, from there, he decided to go to Chicago for more stability. And uh, my three oldest siblings were born uh, and raised there. And then we moved back to, to Mexico or they did, and then I was born there. So we lived there for a little over 15 years, and then the North America, America Free Trade Agreement came in, and that really affected um, our, our family, especially my dad being a farmer. So that was another reason why we decided to migrate to the States. So as you can see, it's like over three generations we've been back and forth. And there's this uh, phrase that it says, uh, poor Mexico so far away from God and so close to the United States. So I feel like a lot of my work, it, it kind of like, it is about that complexity. It is about those histories. And it's revisiting those histories to, to maybe look at the other side that, it, that we haven't paid attention too much. So as, as, an, as an artist, I have the responsibility to use my craft to address issues that affect my community, create awareness, and promote actions through my art. So this is some of the work that I did during um, my grad studies. My major was in drawing, but I, s I found ceramics uh, in the first year, I just taken it as an elective. And that kind of like, I really connected with that material a lot. And I almost see it as, as drawing, but in a three-dimensional form. And I like that aspect of the immediacy of converting an idea to a three-dimensional for, form by just molding the clay. Um, for this works, I was thinking about exploring the complexity of, of identity of, uh, as an immigrant Latinx person living in the United States. And I was also intentional about claiming space. So this is a big uh, gallery in a museum, at the Grand Rapids Art Museum. So I intentionally wanted to stain all those walls with this uh, red uh, clay as a way of uh, claiming space and taking space. I see this, this uh, self-portraits as an exploration of, of the complexity, one, as humans, and then two, as an immigrant person, but also kind of like then living and experiencing uh, life as a racialized group in, in the United States. So this is a piece uh, titled Double Consciousness, referencing the, the writings of W.E.B. Du Bois, who was very formational for, for me as soon as I started college. I went to community college and that's, that's um, I did that for, for a year. And that's how I got to think about some of those ideas that I wanted to translate into artworks. Some of the work is, is meant to be also playful, but then it has these different layers. Like this one, it's, it's titled uh, El Marciano. And I'm kind of like referencing when I first saw my, my permanent legal alien card, you know, just the name, alien, I was just, really intrigued by that, so I wanted to turn that into a piece. And some of these other portraits, they all come from a mold that I pressed the clay onto it, and then I was, that gave me the opportunity to modify them 
and kind of like impersonate all these different historical moments or, or points in history that I wanted to kind of like hint at or, or reference. So this is, uh, you know, like, well, another thing that I like to play around is the titles. Some of them are translated, some are mistranslated, and some are just in one language because it just makes more sense. So this is also referencing, you know, um, colon colonization, uh, colonization in Mexico and how the Catholic Church also changed a lot of, of the life of the indigenous people there. Uh, one thing that, um, that I was excited about working with clay during this time and also using molds was that I was able to take more experimentation and more risk. Like a lot of these pieces are done in different processes. This is a wood fire, some are, some are raku, some are electric kiln uh, firing, some are uh, gas uh, fire. So I was just really interested in in pushing the medium, but also learning along the way. And um, I have a lot of slides, it's, uh, slides so I'm just gonna go through some of them. And to me, this kind of like summarizes my, my grad studies, right? Like this idea of, of feeling that pressure of try to make something with all this knowledge that you gain, but also the skills of making artwork and and that's how probably I felt after um, I finished. But this one's for instance, uh, we have an expression that says, leer quita lo pendejo, which this trans is, is hard to translate it. So I just kind of like, I kind of leave it like whoever knows some Spanish, they get a little bit of a kick out of it. Like you get a laugh. After that, I went and I did a, a residency at the Harvard Ceramics Program. And that was a great opportunity to have also access to the Peabody Museum and kind of like study the, the permanent collection of the pre-Columbian art. Um, and I was able to handle those works and, and draw them and be inspired by it. So the title of this series is um, No One Discovered the Americas. And I, I, I was interested in creating like this ghost-like feel with the cell portraits. And once again, uh, using um, clay slip to paint on the, the walls. And then this, this series of works started in 2016. And for this, I was more interested in kind of like world building, kind of like trying to create my own world. And part of it was because of the the political climate that was going on in the 2016s, as we all might remember. And um, so this kind of like, this came more from an inspiration of, of, of um, Afrofuturism, thinking about Sanra, the music, the film, and even like the, the suits that he will create and the music and all that stuff. So I was interested in how can I create like my own world and and that's when I started using the, the cactus as a, as a metaphor. Cac uh, the cacti plant is, or succulents are, are very resilient and uh, adaptable. So I'm using that as a metaphor for, you know, immigrant, uh, the immigrant community, um, indigenous, black, and people of color, and just thinking how we are resilient. And we're, s you know, we survive all these different um, um, oppression and discrimination and we're still here, like we're not going anywhere. So the cactus plant is, is very resilient and adaptable. So that's why I, I like to almost impersonate that and use it in, in my work. So these are some of the, uh, those pieces from that series. And and this, you know, I decided to take my time with this body of work. Like I'm still working on developing these pieces from ceramics. Now they have gone to, this is still clay. Um, later I will show some, some that are also in, in metal. 
and now we're kind of like playing around with those here, uh, making some of those out of glass. This is uh, another piece that uh, is titled the Env Environmental Tree of, of Little Village. This was done in 2020, and part of it was just thinking about the social um, injustices, especially environmental injustices that were happening in Chi and, and they're still happening in Chicago, especially in black and brown uh, neighborhoods. So this one in particular talks about right before the pandemic, there was already some talks about taking down a power plant that was in the Little Village neighborhood for a long time. And then the pandemic hit, so that community was already a struggli a struggling with a lot of respiratory issues. And then they decided to take that plant down during the pandemic like erupting this big, um, this, um, s you know, ashes and smoke and polluting the air even more. So that just, that's kind of like a, a memorial for that, that piece. Um, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to do a residency at the Kohler um, Art Center. And um, there I got to work with glass I came not knowing anything about, um, I'm sorry, metal. And then uh, this is some of the work that I was able to do there. So it's once again, it was like a three month residency. So part of it was learning the process, I started to make some pieces and then um, and the experiment and take risk. So these are some of the pieces that were done during that residency. For some of these works, it took me a while to even come up with the titles. Like I just was in a very, um, like the way I thought about it is like I'm here to make work. I'm just gonna make work and then I can process what I'm creating later. So this is the other piece that I was talking about earlier, referencing that series, Nopales Hibridos. Now I'm making it out of, in this case, metal. and then playing around with how I show it with the other pieces that were made during that time. I still have some other pieces in my studio that I'm still processing and reactivating. And then uh, I was invited to this show, ceramic show, in at the Crocker Art Center or Art Museum. And I created this piece, um, the title of the exhibition was belonging. So to me, uh, I decided to create this piece titled A Hand Je Gesture to Systemic Racism, Al que le quede el saco que se lo ponga. And once again, it's with this idea of, of uh, when I was in grad school, I was one of the few brown people in the whole school. So soon after, I started working for that college and I started doing all these different or being part of all these different initiatives and task force about diversity within that area and, and organizations and things like that. And it's something that I didn't study, but I was passionate about it, but, and I was always in those conversations. And even now, you know, after so many years of being part of those groups, I feel like there's always a lack of action in all these things. And of course we saw in 2020, like all this, um, museums and institutions advocating that they were gonna do better, right? And some of them, there's th they just, it was more like a marketing thing. It's like, oh, we all have to put post this. But very few of them have actually created those things that they say they were gonna do. So that piece is kind of like showing that um, frustration. And um, and once again, the, the Spanish part of the title is que le quede el saco que se lo ponga. So it's like if, I'm not necessarily like directing this to any institution. It's more like if they feel like they haven't done their part, then they probably feel like this piece is for them. If they have their done their part, they probably feel okay. <coughs> and um, and this piece has all these different texts around the this um, um, column like and. With that series that I call uh, um, 
memorials and what do I call it? Monuments and memorials. Um, this second piece was made with that um, kind of like referencing uh, the book by James Baldwin, The Fire Next Time. And um, for me, I was interested in this idea of, of, I guess, of the immigrant and Latinx experience in the United States and thinking about fire as a symbol of transformation. And just thinking about my own experience, when I first arrived here, I didn't know the language, didn't understand the school system. And after 20 years or 20 plus years of being here, thinking about all that transformation and overcoming all those obstacles. So it's like, it's referencing these two phases, like one where you're just kind of like feeling less than, but then just this procession, um, this progress, I just feeling like comfortable with yourself and overcoming all those things and hoping, and in this case now also like hoping that my own experience can, other, other people can relate to, to that experience. There's a quote, I'm just gonna skip that. And most recently, um, this is, I started doing some public sculpture commissions. I applied for this opportunity through, through the Richard Hunt Award and I was uh, awarded some money to create a uh, public piece of artwork. And this, this one is done with uh, cotton steel, the base, and the top is uh, bronze. So for this one, I worked with you know a fabricator and also with the foundry, where they did a lot of the process and I just had to make the sculpture. And I ended up doing a lot of it because the budget was really low, so I had to make the molds and get the wax ready and things like that. But I was interested in that because I'm always interested in learning something new and it was nice to see um, how they make those pieces. So now, as, as a citizen, I believe that social change starts within oneself and that it takes community and relationships to manifest the change that we want to see. Together, we can create a more equitable and just society. So another part of my practice is, is sharing what I know as far as like knowledge, techniques, and things with community. Um, I teach at the School of the Art Institute but of course not everyone can afford to go there. So it's like how can we create ways of bringing art to the people, to their communities, and maybe like um, give them like the same experience. So through this uh, Instituto Grafico de Chicago, it's a pre-making collective that we've been active for over 10 years. And we usually put uh, an event that we call Grabadolandia like Printland, and essentially we invite different printmakers from the area. They can sell their artwork, they keep all the funds, and all we ask is that they teach a printmaking technique for the audience. So that way, you know, younger artists or their parents, their grandparents, uh, they come and they make a piece of, of art, and they can take it with them. Another thing that we do with this collective, we do print portfolio exchanges based on a theme. We create an edition of prints and then we create these portfolios and then the prints get um, you know, spread out to all the artists and we have a few um, portfolios that we use for traveling shows. So these are some of the works that I've done with that collective. And then um, this is a print from a mural that I created with, with youth um, in 20, my 2009. And I decided to make a print since um, unfortunately a lot of those issues are still relevant. So here's a little bit more of Grabadolandia. This is all the print makers in, in Chicago. Another organization that I'm part of is the Color Network. And the Color Network came about maybe like five years ago or, or six. And part of it was um, just a few artists in ceramics realized that we were not 
quite visible or represented in the ceramic field. And little by little, we started getting together and, and then we decided to create this, this organization. And it's all volunteer work. And since then it has grown a lot. So we have a website where we can do several things. We have a database, we can do artist spotlight. Um, we can, um, another thing that we do is a mentorship program where we can connect a mentor with a mentee. And they're, you know, they're connected and we usually ask them for a six month period. They can meet like, you know, once a month. And we're always looking for more mentors and, men and mentees. And that way they can talk about their art practice or depending on where they are in their career, they can ask for feedback. And part of this is like with the idea that we noticed that there wasn't a space like that. So if we were able to create this, you know, anyone here in the audience or any other community that feels marginalized, they can do the same. You know. So as an educator, I want to impact the lives of my students in a positive way and inspire new generations of artists to continue guiding forthcoming generations creating an unbroken chain of shared knowledge. And that really, that really comes from my first mentor, Ricardo Santos, who had an amazing passion for teaching. And I had the opportunity to work with him on this, on this, on creating this, porf this uh, mural. And we were co-teaching the mural, but I was really just learning like his teaching style and his expect, you know, his aspirations and expectations from the students. And then after that project, I started like doing my own mural projects and leading them. But it was kind of like with that same um, sentiment, kind of like creating that chain of knowledge that gets passed down. And now I get to share those skills with, with others. So here are some more murals. And then this is the one that I was referencing earlier with the prints. Um, this mirror is still there. It's still very, you know, tagged with a lot of things. But the sad thing about this mirror is that it's still relevant. You know, like we decided to approach this mural in a more direct uh, way. Most of the murals are done with images, try to make it more universal language. For this one, we wanted to be like straight on, like these are our, our demands. And that was done in 2009, and unfortunately, it's still pretty relevant. When I was the artist in residence with the city of Boston, um, I worked uh, at this um, school with, with some of the youth there. And uh, we decided to use free making as a way of, of creating this other project where they can contribute a print to the mural and then um, they can also keep one or two for for their own and that kind of led to this other community-based project where where I, I call tortilla social where I use this tortilla printing press to make both um, tortillas but also prints and thinking about how um, Food is a good connector, it's a good equ uh, equalizer for hierarchies. So the way, sh the way I usually approach this workshop, which I still do on different places uh, around the, the country, I bring the press, uh, we decide what theme we wanna address, we talk, we talk about it, we make prints about that, and then um, we sometimes if we have enough time, we also create like a a dinner and a dialogue. Sometimes it's just the printing component and sometimes we do both. Um, so once again, referencing the my, my whole practice, I, I see that the artist is important, the role of myself as a citizen, and also the responsibility as, as, the, uh, as an educator. So once again, I really look at these three um, parts or components of my career as kind of like what keeps me going. They fuel each other to really um, allow me to do the work that I do. So that's it.
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wanted to keep it a little short in case you guys have any questions or. Okay, I'll, I'll, ch I'll check it out. What's the name of the book? God's okay, God's Middle Finger. <laughs> uh -huh. All right, I'll check it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's definitely like a reference like I feel like my training was in graphic design that's what I study and then my master's was in drawing and then that shifted to doing clay work and things like that so I think every now and then I do gravitate to that graphic component and I have a few motifs that I kind of like repeat over and over I don't have a, a image here but with that same style I recently in the studio I just painted this big abstract painting using those shapes. Um, so I'm thinking I'm approaching more like clay slip as, as a paint material, thinking about this clay murals of some sort. So I'm interested in, in bringing that into, into the conversation too. But yes, it's all referencing, um, you know, part of it is like the architecture, but also like this very earthy tones uh, in the work. And uh, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, I feel like working with glass, at least in this in this residency, has been just like a wonderful experience, because pretty much all I have to do is come up with ideas, and then uh, they're the ones who are really executing the work. So it's like a you know a great opportunity to to see the work being made, but also learn more about the material. And then, you know, this is the first time that I, I get it, an opportunity to translate my works into glass. So now I'm, I'm seeing a lot of potential in that material too. I don't think it would take me a long time to get that kind of skill level, <laughs> but, uh, but I can see how I might be interested in doing more residencies in a similar um, structure. And especially after five days, this is my fifth day, so this is only five days, and they were able to make all this work. So I think it's it's more um, trying to process that information. And I think later on we'll be like, okay, now that I learned how all these things are possible in glass, I could probably come more prepared for another residency. But but yeah, it's it's exciting. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, yeah. Yeah. So the question is about using different mediums and maybe some of the failures that happen within that. And the way I look at it, uh, at it is like failing forward. Like I, that's why I like taking risk. It's like you always learn something from those mistakes. And part of it is like you just have to try it. And I tell that to my students all the time. And even like coming to this residency, I was like, I was feeling nervous too. I was like, well, I'm new to this material. So I think, uh, it's good to also put yourself in that moment of being vulnerable, like not knowing exactly how to use a material or understand it to provide direction on, on what can be made. Um, 
but yeah, I'm 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 all for making mistakes and my rule is like if something doesn't work, I put it on the side and then I keep working on it. And sometimes those pieces become like a thing. You know, they, they evolve and they they make it to the cut. And sometimes you just have to let them go. <laughs> but I feel like part of making mistakes is just trying. Try to do that one thing, and if it doesn't work, you can try it again, or maybe it's just something that you just need to get out of your system. And that way you can say, well, at least I tried it. Uh, but, but yeah. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs>
So hi everybody, welcome to Museum of Glass. Today we'll be working with our guest artist, Salvador Jimenez Flores, and we'll be making some of his sculptures. He's been our guest artist since Wednesday. You can see some examples of the sculptures that we made for him on the table and on the two pedestals. Just to get you started, I'm going to give you just a very brief introduction to how glass blowing works. Everything that we do starts out in our glass furnaces. The glass furnaces are the machines where you see the doors close. There's two of them. If you look up on the big screen, you'll see a diagram. That's what they look like inside. So inside each of the furnaces is a big ceramic pot. In that ceramic pot is a thousand pounds of melted glass. We keep the melted glass at 2100 degrees. And at that temperature, the glass has the consistency of honey. So if you can imagine a giant crock pot full of honey, that's what our furnace is like. We want to get the glass out to make stuff. We take those steel pipes and we dip them into the molten glass. A little bit of the glass sticks to the end of the pipe. The pipe itself is hollow. So when you blow, the ball of glass on the other end blows up like a balloon. If you want to make something larger, we dip it in, blow a little bubble, let it harden. Then we dip it in a second time or a third time. And we just keep building up the glass in layers. All the glass that's in those furnaces is clear glass. It has no color. We buy colored glass separately in various forms. We buy it in bars. We buy it in little chips. We buy it in powders. And when we want to make a colored object, we blow a little bubble of clear glass from the furnace. We heat up a chunk of the colored glass. And then we coat that clear bubble with a layer of the colored glass. This is called a color overlay. The reason we do it this way is we can have any color we want any time we want. If we filled up the furnace with blue glass, we could only make blue things. If we coated in them individually, we can make any color. We can make a red thing, then a green thing, then a blue thing, however we want to do that. Once you get the glass out of the furnace, it only stays soft for a little while. So we do it every shaping we can while it's still hot and soft. And then when it starts to get stiff, we go to the second type of furnace. The second type of furnace is called the glory hole. The glory holes are the round guys with the doors open. Those have no glass in them. They're just a hot chamber for heating and softening the glass while we're working. If you've ever seen anybody work at a forge making horseshoes or swords, they take the metal, put it in the fire, soften it, they work on it a little bit, then back in the fire, soften it again, and work on it some more. That's the same routine you'll see here with the glass. So generally, when we make uh, something that's complicated, like these, we make all the little parts first, and then we stick it together. So we might make this cactus paddle here first. And then we'll make the body, then we'll take the paddle and stick it on top. So Gabe in the center, he's making a flower. And that will be part of one of the sculptures we'll make later on. Has 
Has anybody got any questions so far? Folks that you see who are working the glass are our Museum of Glass Hot Shop team. They work for the museum. They're all very talented glass blowers. When we have a guest artist who's not a glass maker, as Mr. Flores is not, then we he makes a design and we make the object. Over on the right, that's Sarah, Sarah Gilbert. And she's making the cactus fruits that you see over here. They're called the tuna. It's the fruit of the prickly pear cactus. Has anybody got any questions? Yeah. Are there ramps to glass blowing? Like windmills? Not really here in the United States. Um, usually there's one person in charge of the project that we're doing that's, that's uh, called the gaffer, and everybody else is an assistant. So in this case, Gabe in the center is the gaffer. We almost always work in teams. It's, you can work it by yourself, but it's very limiting. I would compare it to those one-man bands where the guy has the drum on his stomach and the cymbals on his head. How long does it take to finish one? Well, it depends on what you're making, but uh, see that big brown one over there? That took all day. Uh, these are probably two, three hours. It all just, just depends on what you're making, how complicated it is. So this is our, our guest artist, Salvador Jimenez Flores. Let's have a big hand. So he's not a glassmaker himself, but he's a very excellent artist. So we invited him here. He's come up with ideas for different sculptures, and our resident team is making the sculptures from his drawings. We put up some of his artwork up on the big screen. So if you look up on the big screen, this is his artwork that he usually does. Some of it is bronze, some of it is clay. He doesn't normally work in glass, but for this week, we're working with him and making stuff out of glass. glass we use? We use a glass uh, that's specially formulated for hand blowing. It's a soda lime glass. 
It's made of sand, soda, ash, and lime, and it's formulated to harden slowly so that we can work it by hand. The glass that goes in a bottle is made to harden very quickly so a machine can make a thousand bottles in an hour. Our glass is formulated to harden slowly so we can shape it by hand. I don't know. What? I don't know. I didn't see her. Which box? Oh, this seven here? This is called the garage. It's a, a warming oven, and when we make things in parts, we put them in there keep them warm, we're ready to assemble the object, we pull them out and heat them up a little extra. So everything that we do has to be cooled slowly or it'll break. So we put it in those big ovens, those are called annealers. And so the stuff that's in there is stuff that we made yesterday and it's just finally cooled down, and we can take it out and look at it. If we just make these things and we put them on the table and walk away, they'll cool too quickly and unevenly, and they'll break. So the stuff that we're making today will go into that big black oven on the opposite side. It's the exact same machine as that. We keep it at 920 degrees. We place all the objects we make during the day in there, and then at night it has a little computerized thermostat that slowly turns the temperature down to room temperature. Hi, how are you guys? Good. Do you guys have any questions? Okay. So in the center, we're about to do what's called a color overlay. Sayuri sitting down has the colored glass. She just handed it to Carly. Now she has a bubble of clear glass. Carly's going to heat up the colored glass, and we're going to coat that clear bubble with the colored glass. This is the way we color most of the things that we make. We drop one blob of the colored glass on top of the clear bubble, and then we're going to smear it until it entirely coats the original bubble.
Why is the building so tall? There's three reasons why the building's in this shape. Reason number one, most important, it looks really cool. Reason number two, the whole building is designed to act as a giant chimney. So there's a natural updraft to take the heat and smoke away from the furnaces. Reason number three is historical. Along this waterway, before the museum was here, there were a number of sawmills. The sawmills had big cone-shaped metal outbuildings where they burned the waste wood from the sawmills for power. You can see a picture up on the big screen. When the architect saw these old buildings, that's what gave him the idea to make the building in this shape. Is there a school that, that teaches this stuff? There's lots of them. There's, there's well, uh, in Seattle, there's uh, the University of Washington teaches it. Uh, here in Tacoma, you can learn glass blowing in the public schools. You start in middle school and go on through high school. Across the nation, there's about 50 art colleges that have glass blowing. So there's lots of different places to learn. Yes, the color overlays. So the bubble that we're making in the center is going to be one of these cactus paddles that you see here. And we're going to use it in one of the sculptures we make later on. Mr. Jimenez Flores, our guest artist, was born in Mexico, grew up there. He now lives and works in the United States. but. He uses a lot of cactus imagery in his work, and in his work, it kind of symbolizes to him resilience. The cactus is a really tough plant. It uh, can survive under harsh conditions, and it's sort of a metaphor for people uh, who migrate from the United States, from Mexico to the United States, who have to uh, 
meet the challenges of adapting to both cultures. Over on the right, Sayuri has gone over to our pipe cooler. Is a steel trough. We lay the pipe in the steel trough and we spray water on it to cool it down and make it easier to hold. So this bubble that Sayuri is preparing in the center, that's going to be one of our cactus paddles. The tool in her hand is called the block. It's made out of wood. It's stored in a bucket of water. As long as the wood is wet, the tool doesn't burn, and it doesn't leave any marks as she shapes the glass. Yes. What's the most complicated piece we ever made? Hmm. One of the kids' things, we have this contest for kids, and we did a collaboration with kids from China. And uh, can we put up the kids' design stills? Go, just click through them. I'll tell you when to stop. There. This was one of the most, I don't know if it's the most, but one of the most complicated. It took six and a half hours to make that. There's so many little details. So we, we have a contest for kids. Any kid can do a drawing. Once a month, we pick one of the drawings and we make it out of glass. And we try to make, we make two of them, one for the kid to take home and one for the museum collection. And it's, it's free to enter, any kid 12 or under. That was, that was one of the most complicated. So now in the center, Sayuri, to the left of the workbench, she's the person that's blowing. She's blowing through that steel tube and inflating the bubble as Gabe, sitting at the bench, shapes it. So now Gabe in the center. They're letting that bubble cool, stretch. Glass is soft. And if you point it downward, the bubble will stretch under its own weight. Now Gabe is taking a tool called the jacks and squeezing the glass and making a narrow part at the top. His assistant is holding a wooden paddle in front of his arm to shield him from the heat.
guys have any questions? It's in the garage. She's making the little fruits that go on top of the cactus paddle. It, no, it keeps it warm while we're working. So it doesn't cool down in there. Annealing is when you cool it down slowly after you're done. So this is just, we made a part, keeping it warm until we're ready to attach it. So we want these cactus paddles to be flat in cross-section. So Gabe has got two pa paddles made out of cork, look like cork in a wine bottle. And the cork allows us to press on the glass without marking it. Sarah has a little compressed air gun, and she's blowing the smoke away from from the uh, cork paddles so it doesn't get in the glass blower's eyes. We have two ways in which we heat up the glass. Sometimes we heat it up in the big round oven, the glory hole. Sometimes we heat it up with a torch. When we heat it up with the torch, like Gabe is doing now, we can focus the heat in a particular place. We can make just the part he's torching hot and soft without disturbing the rest of the shape. So he wants to make those edges of that paddle a little sharper. So he softened it with a torch. And now he's going to take the paddles and shape it. making those edges a little pointier.
Um, well, it's the clear glass that surrounds whatever's in the middle. That acts like a lens and magnifies what you see on the inside. They put the clear glass over it. I think we're going to add some flames to this cactus paddle. Sayuri is preparing the red glass. There's some stainless steel bowls on that steel table. They're filled with crushed colored glass called Frit, F-R-I-T. We put up the Frit picture. So we take the clear glass from the furnace, and we roll it in the little chips of colored glass. They stick to the surface, and we go back in the fire. We, they melt, and they form a little candy coating of color like an M&M. So that red that she's applying, that's going to be on the outside. And we've used that to make all the little flames. I don't know. Gabe, what color is that? What color is that? The, the paddle? Green. Green. All the colors you see while we're working are distorted by the heat. If I want to know what color it is, I have to ask.
So the glass that he just applied to the side, that's going to become a mouth. And we're going to have a tongue that sticks out like you see on this one. made some of the tongues just before lunch. They're sitting in the garage, staying warm. Anybody have any questions? Yes. And then the, the bubble contracts. Nothing. We did it earlier. Uh, you see that chalk drawing on the floor? Well, can we put up the, old, the drawing of the previous piece? Let's see. We put up the drawing of the piece we made this morning. So we made this sculpture this morning, and we, we pushed in the sides a little bit, and then we sucked in, and the two sides come together and made that oval in the middle. And then when the air reaches the opposite side of the 
opposite end of the pipe, it's not even warm. Nope, sorry. Just heating up the mouth a little bit, and we're going to suck it in a bit, make it recede into the sculpture a little more.
So now we're going to do what's called cane drawing. Gabe in the center has a stick of colored glass and a torch, and he's melting on the little details. In this case, it's the little spines on the cactus. Yes. Uh, will we put it on our website? Maybe. The best way to see what's, go what's the finished work is to go to uh, Mr. Jimenez Flores' Instagram in a couple of weeks, and he'll put his pictures up on his Instagram. So there's, if you want to take your phone and just click it, you can save that. We're melting on each one of the little spines on the cactus paddle. So over on this bench on the far left, Sarah is making the tongue. Hi, how are you guys? Good. Do you guys have any questions? Good. The furnaces run on natural gas and forced air, and they're well insulated. They're well insulated. So we're making this design that you see here drawn in chalk. This is a very traditional way to design glass. We draw on the floor of the hot shop in chalk, and then we make whatever we drew.
Joe Sayuri has brought over one of the cactus fruit. The tuna, they're called. T-U-N-A. And we're going to attach it to the top of the cactus paddle. We made those earlier this afternoon. They've been sitting in the garage, staying warm. And now we're attaching them. In the center, Gabe is putting some of those little spines on the tongue. So that tongue will be similar to what you see here. This process of melting on the little details is called cane drawing. Every once in a while, you'll see him take a torch and heat up the glass around the end of the pipe. That glass has to be kept warm or it'll crack. So while we're working on the top and on the details, you can get distracted and let it get too cold and then the glass will crack. So we're adding the fruits of the cactus. The fruit of the prickly pear cactus is called tu the tuna, T-U-N-A.
Sarah's coming over with the tongue. Whenever we join two pieces of glass, we have to get both of them hot. So we're heating up the mouth. We'll also heat up the tongue. And we press the two soft pieces of glass together. They'll stick to each other. We're going to add some flowers to the uh, cactus uh, fruit. We made the flowers earlier this afternoon. They're sitting in the garage. Now we're going to attach them.
We're almost done. The reason I know that is I look to the right, and you see one of the glass blowers putting on some protective clothing. She's going to carry the finished piece to our annealing oven, where it'll be cooled slowly overnight. Sayuri, in a sweatshirt, has put on some Kevlar gloves. She's going to carry the finished sculpture to our annealing oven. When she grabs that sculpture, it'll be about 1,000 degrees. At that temperature, the glass will be hard, and will cool it slowly overnight. We're going to take a wet file and score the glass. We want it to break off. We give the pipe a tap. Off it comes. We'll melt the little edge where we broke it off so it's not sharp. And into our annealing oven to cool slowly overnight. So let's have a hand for the Museum of Glass Hot Shop team and our guest artist, Salvador Jimenez Flores. So these guys are discussing what, what they're going to do next. We play color overlay. The color in glass comes from adding various materials to the mixture of raw ingredients called batch. Most of the colorants are compounds containing some kind of metal. For example, adding cobalt to clear glass creates a deep blue. Tin and antimony can be used to create white glass, and gold chloride can produce a rich red or pink colored glass. Colored glass is melted in furnaces, just like clear glass, and then is usually rolled into bars for storage and easy application. In order to apply color bar to a bubble, we first need to preheat the color to approximately 950 or 1000 degrees Fahrenheit in a color oven or garage. Once warm, the color is then picked up on the end of a punty rod using a little bit of clear glass as a support. 
The color is then heated in the 2300 degree glory hole to soften it and make it malleable, while another artist creates a small bubble of clear glass on a blowpipe. Once warm, the color is dropped over the clear bubble, and then using a variety of hand tools or the steel marver, the color is rolled back over the clear in an even layer. This process is called dropping color, or creating a color overlay. Depending on the project, that bubble is then usually gathered over with clear glass and blown into the final form. The finished product may appear to be all made from colored glass, but when viewed in cross-section, we can see that there is only a thin layer of color sandwiched between many layers of clear glass.
So we're making another cactus sculpture. The the bubble that we that Gabe is working on now, that's going to be the body of the cactus. So we're working for our guest artist, Salvador Jimenez Flores. And everything we're making is his design. You can see on the pedestals and on the table, and this other pedestal, these are all examples of sculptures that we made for Mr. Jimenez Flores. Mr. Jimenez Flores is not a glass blower, so when we have a guest artist who's not a glass blower themselves, they come up with designs, and our resident team of glass blowers makes their designs. So we want this cactus to be ribbed. So we're gonna stuff our bubble in a special kind of mold called an optic mold. You can see them on the floor next to Gabe. Gabe's a man working the glass right now. He stuffed the bubble inside the mold the mold has ridges on the inside, and when it comes out, the bubble has those same ridges. Can we put up the optic mold drawing? So we have a little diagram up on the big screen. So the molds are cast metal molds. They have ridges on the inside. We stuff the bubble in there and blow, and when the bubble comes out, it has that rib texture. Does anybody have any questions? Because uh, the effect it makes with the ridges, it bends the light, and so it changes the optics of the bubble. So it's, there's not really lines there, it's just different thicknesses of glass. So it kind of gives it a kind of, in this case, like a kind of pumpkin look. So now we're going to melt on all the little spines on the cactus. Gabe has a stick of colored glass in one hand and a torch in the other. We heat up the tip of the little stick of colored glass and we dab on a little dot for each of the spines.
you guys have any questions?
they'll make a piece that fits in there out of bioglass, and then your body will grow onto it, and the glass will dissolve, and it'll leave a piece of real bone. have an expert with you. The glory holds 2300 degrees, 2140. We have uh, the newer speech pine. A small cactus. Uh, there's a chalk drawing in front of Mr. Flores. It's got a ball-shaped cactus. Well, it was in, in a, uh, what's called a uh, 
pineapple mold. Yeah. Uh, Chris, do we have a photo of the pineapple mold? So that's, it's called a pineapple mold because it looks like a pineapple turned inside out. And we use it mostly to make bubbles. So we stuff the bubble into the pineapple mold and then all it makes all little dents in the surface. And then when we coat it with more glass, each of the little dents traps some air and makes a bubble. So we want patterned bubbles. We use the pineapple mold. But it's a, So we use that to make the texture in the cactus fruits. They have a glass studio there. Um, I don't know how how old it is, but they they've had it there for quite a while. Oh, cool! They should have Jim as their honored speaker.
So we're going to make a small cactus, and then we're going to try blowing into this steel mold that uh, Mr. Jimenez Flores made. So we're making the bubble to make the cactus. Sayuri sitting in the center workbench has blown a bubble of clear glass. We're going to heat up some colored glass. And we're going to coat that bubble with the colored glass. Sayuri, just to the right and center, is going into our glass furnace. Behind that door, there's a big ceramic tank. In that ceramic tank is 1,000 pounds of melted glass. She's coated her bubble with a fresh layer of hot molten glass. The glass that she added is clear glass. The yellow-orange color that you're seeing is the glow from the heat, not the color of the glass. Do you guys have any questions? Yes. They're made with a, a tool called the marble tool. Um, there's two ways to make them. There's the industrial way, where they run down a chute, and they have two spinning wheels that shape them. Uh, there's a, the old-fashioned way is with a marble tool. Do we have a picture of a marble tool? Let's see if we can put one up on the big screen. Maybe not. I'll go get one from the tool room. Forget about that, Chris. I'll get one. a nice sphere.
So Sayuri has gone into our furnace again. We'll add another layer of clear molten glass. Each time we dip it in, it's called taking a gather, G-A-T-H-E-R. We drip the excess off into that steel can. We'll save that excess glass, and eventually that'll go back in the furnace. So here he's gone over to the pipe cooler. We lay the steel pipe in that trough. We spray water on it. The water cools the pipe down and makes it easier to hold. A cactus, a cactus. A big kind of ball shaped one. So in this center, Gabe is shaping the glass using a tool called the block. So Gabe is shaping the glass using a pad of wet newspaper seated to the left of the workbench. Carly is blowing. She's blowing through that steel tube and inflating the glass as Gabe shapes it. round oven that we're heating up the glass in is called the glory hole. We heat it up and make it soft and bring it back to the workbench where Gabe in the hat is shaping it. His assistant is holding a wooden paddle in front of his hand to shield him from the heat. I take it back, we're not making a cactus. This is, we're making the, the lens for, yeah. So uh, our guest artist has brought this um, glass, this metal framework, and we're making a, a lens to go into that uh, framework.
No cactus, we're making a lens.
you're going to do is transfer the glass from the rod it's on now to your second steel rod called the punty. The second steel rod will hold it from the bottom while we shape the top. Ready to break the glass away from the metal pipe. We'll drip some water where we want it to break. We'll give the pipe a tap and off it'll come. It'll be held by the rod that Carly has. Carly's standing up. So here he goes with his water dripping off the tweezers. That cracks the glass. And a little tap, and off it comes.
So we're going to take it off the metal rod. We're going to place it in an oven called the annealer, where it'll be cooled slowly overnight. We're going to make one more little cactus sculpture. You guys have any questions? Over on the right, Sayuri in the black shirt and shorts sticks her pipe into the molten glass. A little bit of glass sticks the end of the pipe. We roll it in little chips of colored glass. Glass that she get in the furnace is clear glass. One of the ways we color it is to roll it in these little chips of colored glass and melt them on. glass that she added to the surface is green. We put it in the fire. We'll melt it on. We'll have a coating of green glass. If we want to get the coating to be smooth, we have to roll it in the little chips colored glass several times, make sure we've got the whole thing coated.
Gabe is shaping the glass using a tool called the block. Now he's shaping it with a pad of wet newspaper. He's preparing the bubble to go into a special mold. The mold is called the optic mold, and it gives the glass a ribbed texture. The molds are to his left. You see the big cone-shaped molds on the floor? Those are the optic molds. So we want a rib texture to this little cactus that we're going to make. He stuffs it in there, blows, and when it comes out, the bubble has those ridges. Cut off the little end there so that it draws the pattern all the way out to the tip. Carly seated to the left. She's the person that's blowing. She blows through the steel tube, the blowpipe, and inflates the glass as Gabe sitting at the bench shape. He's going to squeeze the glass using a tool called the jacks and make a sharp crease in the glass. That's the place where we'll be able to break the, the sculpture away from the metal pipe. Earlier on, we coated that bubble with green glass. Now we're going to dab on the little spines on the cactus. This is called cane drawing. We take a stick of colored glass. We heat up the tip until it balls up, and we just dab on each of the little spines. This is called cane drawing. Cane drawing. We heat up the tip of that little skinny rod of colored glass and melt on the little details.
Marley in the black shirt and jeans has just pulled out one of our cactus fruits that we made earlier this afternoon. Gabe's going to grab a little cactus fruit. And we're going to stick it on. You guys have any questions? You guys know about our contest for kids? It's called Kids Design Glass. If any kid who comes to museum, 12 and under, wants to do a drawing, once a month we pick one of the drawings and we make whatever the kid drew out of glass. We make two copies. One for you to keep, and one for the museum collection. It's, if you want to enter, it's getting a little late, but uh, we have a table out in the lobby where you can do the drawing, or you can grab one of the entry forms, do the drawing at home, and mail it in. Can we put up some of the kids' design uh, stills? So you look up on the big screen. These are all made from kids' drawings who visited the museum. So in this one, you can see the little girl. She's holding up her drawing. She won the contest. And below her are the glass pieces we made from her drawing. It's free to enter. Just go to the table in the middle of the lobby, grab an entry form, do your drawing at home, and you can mail it in. It's a contest for kids. They do a drawing, we pick one, and we make it out of glass.
You're making a little flame on top of the cactus fruit. Almost done. We're going to take it off the metal rod. We're going to place it in our annealing oven where it'll be cooled slowly overnight. Score the glass with the wet file. Give it a tap. And off it comes. We'll melt the little spot where we broke it off so it's not sharp. And into our annealing oven where it'll be cooled very slowly overnight. So that concludes our demonstrations for today. Thank you all for coming.